Gerald Clark on behalf of Seventh Planet Broadcasting. Today's November 27th, 2019. And I got a really special uh, guest today that's going to be with me, Matt LaCroix. He's a fellow author, friend, um, wallower in the uh, Avatar Simulator with the rest of us, and a uh, true seeker. And uh, everybody give Matt a very warm welcome. Hey, Matt, how are you? Hey, Gerald, it's awesome to be back here again. I honestly, I love our discussions. They're very, very important to me. And um, you'll always be the professor to me. Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. There aren't too many people that were like electrical engineering and uh, circuit design, telecommunications that landed in the Anunnaki, ancient history space. That's kind of weird, right? <laughs> Very few. And that's why you're so unique because I know. most individuals that have that kind of intellect, they, they end up never going towards the challenging route of, of taking on the paradigm and you know being accosted from society and being on that lonely road, right? Hey, there's a lot of truth to that. And you've probably walked that road because uh, as soon as you started opening your mouth and talking about things that were alternative to the cultural software that we've been programmed with, and you know what I mean. Uh, I love that term, start, by the way. That's good. You, you start rocking some, some boats, okay? And people don't like people that make waves. They like people that go along and get along, right? So, uh, so the, as soon as you start talking about this kind of stuff, especially since it has such an impact across so many different fields, including really all the religions, not one, okay? Ancient origins in history, uh, the validity of whether your government's telling you the truth, all that kind of stuff, okay? It crosses a whole bunch of really uncomfortable areas that you got to deal with as soon as you open this can of worms. So, oh, long exactly. story short. And you couldn't have said it better <clears throat> myself. Well, when I was in academia at UCSD and working in telecom around a bunch of engineers. Uh, basically, these are, these are sponsored companies that have, been, that have all kinds of Silicon Valley investment dollars in it that are highly focused, okay? They're being watched and vectored and made sure they're doing what they're supposed to. Uh, well, you get in there and, <laughs> and start talking about aliens or something as an engineer, and like, oh yeah, I mean, they'll think you're a nut job and you'll be out like quick. As a matter of fact, one of the, something really funny happened to me. It may have inspired me. I don't know. And I won't name any names, but there was an engineer I really respected and I was working with at uh, Riverstone Networks up in uh, no Northern California, up near San Jose. And uh, I was in there working with him. We were trying to do some work together. Our companies had mutual technology, blah, blah, blah. And I left, and uh, a couple weeks later, I heard that uh, he had left the company and he had decided that he was going to be a UFO researcher. <laughs> it's the first time I ever heard of this going on. It's somebody my age, okay, who was... What did you think it, about that at the time? I didn't know what to think. Everybody else responded and said, that, that dude is a nut job. I mean, I mean, well, I'm sorry, it's not the language. I mean, that's how they treated him. It was like, he slipped a cog. And uh, I don't know what network he's on now, but it's not ours. You know, like that. So I don't know that I don't know the full history of how they treated him because I wasn't there, but I heard through the rumor mill at trade shows and things like that. Of, you know, he kind of marked himself, and as soon as you do that, you're kind of a marked person in the technical field because if they feel like you're not a robot, there's something else wrong with you. I don't know if they can use you anymore like that. Yeah, isn't it? It's like they these individuals who become successful with the system become the defenders of the system themselves, and then even though they have really nothing to lose in doing that. It's like you, you think to yourself, why are these individuals fighting so hard to prevent other individuals from having open-mindedness and, and bringing these alternate concepts into the nature of our reality? And they're, and they're there staunchly defending the system we have about, hey, don't, you know, no imagination. Everything is exactly the way we've been told, you know, our purpose is to just get up and go to work and come home and, and do nothing that contributes towards the personal growth of our spirit and soul. We're just supposed to give all of our energy freely to this system that, you know, conforms us and keeps us on this, these tightly designated topics that we're allowed to discuss and anything that diverges from that, hey, watch out, the guard comes right in, even, even though it's amazing because those people haven't been officially designated as, hey, 
your job is to is to be in this office. And if anyone brings up anything that's unusual, your job is to step in there. No, nobody's been told that. It's just no. perfect. This system. It's like a cultural programming to defend the status quo. And the, yeah. it's like the it's like the firstborns do it better than the middle kids. I don't know why. Have you noticed that? <laughs> um, but at the same time, I have to say, and Chris and I were talking about this this morning. Um, it can be so destabilizing to take away somebody's belief that they thought was true, just even in dialogue, accidentally, just go to blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's like pulling the rug out from under someone, and if their stabilization system isn't working, I mean, it could have real impacts in their life, their family, their ability to earn an income, all that, when you stir them up. So, so in general, what's your experience been when you gently break the God spell with someone, allow them to choose it themselves? Because I ultimately, I don't feel like uh, proselytizing has any place relative to the truth. It has to do with the, the, the being being ready to receive it and seeking exactly. it, because it's, it's out there, it's, it's, it's there. So it's a, like a personal decision to be responsible enough to handle the destabilization that's going to happen when you go grab a hold of that cultural software and start pulling on it and go, okay. I love that term. That, that's, software. That's, that's and it's different every cultural, every yeah. culture, right? And yeah, by so the way, while we're talking about the word culture, if you get a group of people together and you tell them these are the norms, okay, I don't care if it's 15 people or 300 million, okay? Yeah. And you say, well, this is our cultural norm, okay, our mores, our norms, okay? How's that any, that, that is the definition of a cult. I don't care how big it is or small it is. As a matter of fact, I think that's why the word culture is used because it is a cult of people who have agreed to a mutual set of terms that are allowed in their society. And this is the brain software that they get programmed with. And then they turn around and try to defend because if you take that away, now you gotta have something else to, to supplant it because this is, this is our, this is part of our operating system here, okay? <laughs> right? It's our operating system code. It, it, oh. it can't, you can't get any, any more accurate than that. And I love the analogies of using everything in a context of like a computer and having this, the whole idea of software because you're dead on. It's like we have this conditioned programming that, we, that gets designed and instilled in us when we're a very young age. That's the whole idea behind public school, in my opinion is in school in general is because there's this doctrine, this doctrine that's been established for what everything is, you know, the narrative of human history, what our purpose is, you know, what defines us, all those things have woven itself into this, con this cultural software that becomes so ingrained in people and, and covers so many vast areas that like you said, when you try to um, approach someone with some alternate perhaps differing viewpoints on how we can understand everything from, from ancient history to what defines us. It, it's like you, like you said, it's like pulling the rug underneath them. And most people in my, in my experience, 90% of people will just immediately reject that message. And they may start going, Oh, that's really interesting. Cause I'll, I'll start with the idea of bran branching into some of these lower level topics that make them start to think. And then mm. I, I always do the same thing. And I've been trying to get better at this, but I always go too far. And then I always have that point where you see their are eyes. You, are you zealous? Are you too oh. zealous? And um, so you were asking me about how, if I, how I feel about that path and if, if I've been changing my methods. First couple of years, you know, after writing The Illusion of Us and realizing a lot of these, these paradigms and these, these false truths that have been um, shown to us, I was almost like that crazy guy with a loudspeaker running around the streets. Oh, that's great, Gerald. I was like that crazy guy running around the streets, um, you know, hollering and yelling. Just anyone that I was talking to, friends, family, people. Uh -huh. I'd be like, oh, you know, trying to, trying to explain to them all these things. And quickly I realized that you just can't do that. Because like you said, there are individuals who are open-minded and willing uh -huh. to at least accept an idea that's not – the one that they had before. And then the vast majority of other individuals are 
completely unwilling to, ex to even entertain another idea because of how much it could disrupt that delicate paradigm that they base their entire lives around. So to make a long story short, I now try to approach people that I see potential in being open-minded and having interests in other, other areas that aren't mainstream. So I pick and choose carefully because, you know, we only have a certain amount of energy and you can't just go around just draining your energy trying to fight that endless fight when you don't have a chance in the very beginning. Yeah, but as a public figure now and having written books and such and created forums where people can get together and talk about these issues, you've taken a leadership role and established a place where they can talk about it and they don't have to uh, have you convince them they can come to you without you going to them. There's a lot of that happening because they just need a, they need a common group of freaks that they can come and be part of so they go, yeah, I'm not the only one that believes this is crazy, okay, but, but I can't just let it go because it's true, okay, like that. You're right. It's like when, when individuals don't have a support system, they don't have someone mm -hmm. to fall back on, a friend they can talk to this about, even when they go down the road of discovering all these things, there mm -hmm. are a pretty large majority of people who will consciously decide to just slowly forget it. Because if you know, mm -hmm. when new concepts come into our lives and you're learning something new, ancient city names, ancient tablets, whatever it is, if you stop and you don't continue to study it and, and look at it, eventually it will fade away and, and almost seem like it wasn't real because your mm. brain has been so conditioned. Like you said, this cultural software has been in place so long being ingrained since we were a little kid that that is, is, the, is the way that we naturally fall back on uh, as part of our own natural system because we want to mm -hmm. feel like we're in control and we understand this paradigm that we exist in. But like you, you and I both know, is there's there's it's, it's some basically lies on top of lies that has been built on this foundation of sand and we're now just realizing how deep we've gotten into these lies because when you try to explain to people well it's not just about ancient history i mean look up in the sky look all around you we're living in a world that's just full of deception wow i know it's like uh there's a, there's some I remember hearing there was a lie at every level from the intelligence agencies, including the 17 that exist above the level of presidency, okay, in the United States. And I was like, wow, this hierarchical truth thing can really create a system of a bunch of people not knowing what the heck is going on and just following their own limited little agendas to being told what to do. So anyway, uh, well, where do we go from here? Well, what's happening with humanity? Are we gonna are we gonna wake up as a species and suddenly have universal consciousness and start living out the aspired goals that Paul Paul should we we should be looking at, like seeking the light, becoming our highest form in this dimension? Isn't that what we're here for? Yeah, and I mean, I it is amazing when you study the different energies that go along with things like the ages of the Zodiac and how we're constantly moving through space, right? The, now you talk about how there are different energies associated with different regions. Mm -hmm. And as our, as we fly through space and enter different regions and we, and we are the tilt of our axis slowly shifts and we get to a different Zodiac, which by the way, those last for 2,100 years, if people are interested, but as we're finally passing into some of these, these different paradigm changes of energy, we ourselves are going to be forced to change even if we don't like it or not, because we're at the point now where our vibrational energy and our consciousness can no longer be held with that same paradigm. And I, and I know a lot of people will look at me and be like, come on, I look around, everyone's watching reality shows and sitting around and going <clears throat> to malls and stuff, but it's a slow step process. Think about yeah. what happened just less than a hundred years ago. Things yeah. like World War I, World War II, and all these huge wars. People were just throwing themselves to just die. Just oh, yeah. go out there honorably and just get killed. And to, to, to them, that felt like um, a worthy goal to, to do that, to sacrifice yourself for the good of the people and the good of the country. But look at what's happening now. Well, those types of those types of events can't happen anymore. If we had a world war and they were going to draft people, you would see – unbelievable resistance like you've never seen before because now we have changed on a conscious level we now don't view ourselves as ourselves as just expendable for the system to just throw right. ourselves away we now see this <clears throat> individual um consciousness that is 
risen up in terms of us realizing, well, hey, we are important individuals that have um, so much potential in our lives. And I think that even though people might not realize that on a deep level i think it, it's it's happening in the in the lower lower forms of our subconscious we are we are changing and evolving but that evolution of consciousness is happening a little bit too slowly for some right well i don't I, you know yeah for you and i it's probably not happening fast enough because you don't want to be surrounded by people that don't have the same consciousness as you are because they're Yucky birds of a feather flock together, and you're scaring me, okay? Like that. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say uh, one thing I discovered, and I think we've already talked about this, is that it wasn't my job to wake anybody up, even though I thought it was. I thought I was supposed to share all this information to help people move along in the progression of their consciousness. That's not. That's not right. <laughs> It's, it's for me to share my, my experience, whether they want to listen to it or not, that's, a, that's up to them. You know, I'm just saying this is the map I use to get through to A and B, and I just happen to be decided to tell you about it. That don't mean you have to listen to me. Yeah, but, right? but you're the same. a unique individual, though, because of your studies into AI technology and, and software programming, uh, you quickly realize that the human brain mimics those same types of processes. And so you were able to come at this in a way that maybe no other researcher that I know of ever has. I don't know any other software engineers that have worked on AI that became truthers like this. I know, well, the, the thing that really got, it, got me was uh, the COGSI, um, the uh, computer engineering mix between cognitive science and, compu and computers. And ultimately I ended up in this I don't want to get too far into it, but I ended up in this crazy artificial intelligence graduate class with Robert Heck Nielsen. He was the founder of HNC Software. You probably never heard of him. Um, brilliant guy. Loved him to death. He was an adjunct professor, and he was teaching a three-sequence uh, seminar in grad school on Portronic networks, which is essentially neural networks in your brain. Yeah. And so he had us writing the software to show how this worked, okay? So I, was, I wasn't just you know, a passerby listening, go, well, that could work, a genetic algorithm, that could work. We were actually doing this stuff, okay, and messing around with it. And sometimes it was quite frightening how much I realized we really know about human processes and stuff and can model with a computer. It was way further along than I thought. Everything yeah, and it just shows you that if, if you guys came up with that and as part of that company, just imagine what things like higher up individuals who are in charge of programs, you know, things like the CIA and other, uh, other yeah. mind control yeah. type of organizations who realize, oh, <clears throat> hey, we can completely um, play around with society knowing exactly what's going to make them tick and what's going to make them act a certain way. And so it's, it's like right. conditioned programming, right? Exactly. So one of the crazy things I was involved in that we're sharing is uh, I got involved with DARPA for seven years in the Rotocraft Pilots Associate. They knew I had spent seven years in a cockpit, so they wanted me to take what was in my head and learning to do all that in a cockpit yeah. and transfer it to some software so they could do it with autonomous drones and eventually with a, I don't know, uh, a predator drone so they could kill people with it. I don't know what they were thinking, okay? But so I spent a lot of time in this and there was a, there was a point in that process where suddenly I put myself in the seed of anal analyzing myself as an interesting entity and what's interesting. And all of a sudden I woke up, I realized what was going on in the simulation. I can't explain like it fully to yourself you. in a different way, right? I saw myself in a completely different way. It's like that movie 13th floor where they discovered they were in a simulation like that. Yeah. And it tripped me out. Okay. And I didn't really have anybody to talk to about it, uh, but I realized uh, the holographic nature of, what I was experiencing in this avatar body early on. And remember, I was, I was having out-of-body experiences like mad when I was 15 to 17 years old. I was writing them all down, okay? Just like, like it was normal. Well, I knew I was an eternal energy being when I was 17 because of that. And the, this was just an illusion, okay? And I treated it as such. Actually, that's why, <laughs> that's why I got so much pain right now. I, I treated my avatar body as just something to take me from A to B. And I didn't care what it was. I did it including hang gliding, uh, extreme sports, 
uh, triathlons, you, you name it. Even though I was injured, I still did all that crazy stuff. Well, at least so. you had all those built upon experiences that made you who you are, even though oh. maybe some oh. of that pain oh. now isn't perhaps quite worth it, but. No, I wouldn't recommend treating your avatar body too hard because when you get older after a while and gravity finds its way in there, it's, it's going to hurt like a sun gun unless you've been doing yoga or something to keep yourself adapting with the gravity field so you're not all messed up, okay? Yeah, well, well so, along those lines, why don't you update everybody on what you've been um, working on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I don't talk about this side of myself before. I was a structural integrator long before uh, I became an ancient alien researcher. As a matter of fact, while I was in, uh, at UCSD working and in the field as an electrical engineer, uh, I was still doing structural work as kind of an expansion of my holistic healthcare practice because I really wanted to be a healer. I think more than I wanted to be designing military industrial complex toys that were designed to kill and snoop on people. Okay, that's what they did with people like me that were high level. They just use them for their intelligence to create terrible things, right? Well, they would tell you, they would tell you this job's commercial. We're going to build the fastest processor over here, parallel processor for the gaming industry. You're going to beat NVIDIA, blah, blah, blah. And then it kind of turned out that no, you just built a neural network for General Atomics uh, Predator drone like that. You know, and this, this happened to me twice. Matt, and when I finally threw the pineapple grenade in the last time and said, this ain't hap- this ain't going to happen again, I really threw it hard. And it turned out that uh, some of the people involved were the ex-chief administrators of NASA who had lied to me, including Dan Golden. I'll say his name right in front of him, okay? I ate lunch with that guy many times over at the Torrey Pines Lodge while we uh, figured out how to build this thing for him while they lied to me, okay? I was working at UCSD at Cal IT2 at the time. So when I found out there was contracting fraud, that they were lying to me about what I was doing and they were mishandling me, they knew I was a liability because I was an ex-military officer with uh, not a lot of budging came to lying, cheating, and stealing. I didn't tolerate that crap at all. If you were doing that, you're going to find out about it and you're going to be out of my service. So how did you get wind about those projects being different than you thought? <clears throat> it turned out that I ended up out on the... Uh, flight line for General Atomics discussing how these pieces we were building were going to fit into their final product with the program manager that let it kind of slip. I was so shocked to be on the flight line of General Atomics talking about a Predator drone with a project I thought was commercial. Okay? Yeah. So, anyway. I had lots of of interactions with three-letter agencies and such in my job because of what I did. I was right in the middle of some very cutting edge research with a private company called Reticular Systems as well that had open contracts with DARPA and many other three-letter agencies that we were working with, okay? So I had, a, I had a spook career for about seven years while I was in college, and it, it spooked me so bad. Once I got out of it, it was hard to get engineering work anymore. Once you showed your fangs and said, no, I'm not down with lying, cheating, stealing, or blah, 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 yeah, because you're, you're, you were that liability, that, that smart guy that wasn't willing to play the game anymore. So people were I was like, like, I was like, I was like Edward Snowden. Yeah, I wasn't willing to play the game. I turned in the contracting flaw. They sicked lawyers on me. Lawyers from Virginia made sure that every piece of equipment I had didn't have any of their information on it like that. And then uh, threw me out in the street, pretty much. <sighs> so, but I felt right about it. And I was really upset that somebody could lie to me to that extent about what I was doing for them. That it didn't happen just once. So. But it led to you writing some incredible books that have really changed a lot of people's lives. Um, I yeah. know that I, I gained a tremendous amount of information and wisdom upon meeting you. And that, that interaction of working <clears throat> with you was definitely what spawned a lot of my later research and expanding onto areas that I wasn't even fully aware of. Um, All right. Like the, yeah. big, the big area that I, that I do a lot on with the eagle and the serpent was something I know. that was <laughs> way back, really way back in the hockey series. I remember writing that stuff with you, uh, and uh, you really glomming on to that. It really smacked you in the head with uh, the symbols between the. the oh, eagle and I the remember. Serpent. I remember sitting at my computer because we were putting together the whole conflict between um, the eagle, uh, the serpent, dragon gods of the Americas, and we were, yeah. we were contrasting with all of these conquistadors that were coming over and conquering and destroying these cultures. And all of a sudden, like I remember just looking at 
that type of interaction and these symbols popping up and, and then quickly realizing that what we've been told about these symbols, you know, is, is the complete opposite. You know, the idea of walking out along yeah. the street and someone has, you know, one of those old fashioned um, flags and, you know, it's got maybe like an eagle on it or above their door is adorned with an eagle. And I, it's, just, it's just everywhere, right? I, this In the United States, wow. it's everywhere. The eagle is just completely covering our uh, nation, showing, mm-hmm. trying to portray itself as this bird of freedom and truth when it really, you know, Wait they walk in that. Bird of freedom and truth? When you go in nature and watch an eagle, okay, these are the highest level predators from above. Death from above. That's what they represent from a military sea cube standpoint, yep. okay? All right. From any, if you own the sky in a modern military battlefield, you own the you own the theater of war. Yeah, and, and it's like you have it's like awareness. It's like control right. and awareness over everything, right. and it's not and what we thought. Right. But it's the amazing thing to me was that moment of realization where, wow! So these symbols that that some of the most important symbols of all have been completely inverted to their opposite meanings. That's a oh, yeah. that's a tough pill to swallow, Gerald. Well, through history, when you see symbols perverted, subjugated, so that this person is made to look bad relative to it, and yeah. how many times it happens? It seems it's like, like oh, it's happened more this... than, than the truth is, has actually been coming out. Oh, exactly. So, you know, a symbol is just a symbol, and it conveys what it's supposed to at the time relative to the people that are controlling it. So you don't really know what it represents at the time unless you know about the organization that's using it. And I, I remember so, also one of the other problems, and I, and I will completely um, admit this, was when I was young, a lot of my life, I didn't think that anything was connected. I didn't think anything was connected at all. And I just remember in terms of symbols and things like that, I remember just taking everything for face value for what it was and not thinking in depth about things like um, logos for companies and flags and what the, what's on those flags and these symbols that were carried all over the world. It wasn't something where I was like, hmm, scratching my head. It wasn't until later that it happened. And I think that mm-hmm. a lot of people are just on autopilot with, with these, this, this cultural software that we've been conditioned around. And I think right. once you stop and you start looking around and really becoming aware of your world, it completely blows your mind because you realize it's everywhere. It's all, around, it's all around us. One of Timothy Leary's uh, latent DNA circuits that he had as his model for humans I just watched a special on him and Rob Doss the other night. It was interesting. It was called Dying to Know. I recommend it. Cool. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, lose my point of thought on that one. I did. Sorry about that. <laughs> so you were talking about cultural software and how, you know, the ideas can be inverted. Oh, the latent circuit. The latent circuit yeah. was the key. Okay. Well, as part of this, one of the latent circuits was a symbolic one. So when you notice that the being suddenly sees the symbols that are obviously all over in culture around them, but they've been there all along, but when they finally tune in on them and start decoding them, that, that circuit in their system has been triggered. You could go back and read about it in my seven plan. That's that cool. Book. I think I, I put in the different things that happen at these different circuits. I think that Anunnaki series where we did the eagle and the serpent, I think it triggered a deep <laughs> activation of your symbolic circle, uh, uh, latent circuit. And, it, and it's taken a while for it to flesh out, hasn't it? It's been going on for a couple of years, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's been a wild couple of years. Um, the last couple of years, it put me into a spiral of just realizing that there's these enormous truths that have re- remained hidden for far too long. And I, I went on a, a, a crusade, I guess you could call it. I wrote um, two books, but, but the, second, the second book that I just released um, this past summer, a lot of the content in that does focus around symbols and the eagle and the serpent. And I know you'll probably be w- well aware. Let me just grab this. Um, yeah. In one, of our, in one of our favorite books together of all time, um, oh, one of the great yes. quotes oh, yeah. from Manly Pihal, Manly P. Hall says in this, and, this, and I included it in, in the, my latest book, is he says that once um, humanity realizes the truth behind symbols and their meanings, a great veil will fall right in front of our eyes, and all of a sudden we'll realize that we, you know, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but w- we exist in, in this reality of symbols and meanings that we had, we were previously not even aware of at all. 
And, and like you mm. said, I, I really like that about the whole latency symbolic um, triggering of event. Once, once you start paying attention to symbols and their meanings, you right. all of a sudden start to see things all around you that you, that you never even saw before. Like they were just sort of um, existing in the background of your awareness. The, la the last circuit, according to him, was an energetic circuit. I think it was number eight or nine from Leary. And I thought that one was very, very interesting. It had attributes that were different than the other circuits, one of which was it's, it's triggered by what looks like the energy coming from outside, like from our sun, like, an, like a transit through the galactic center that would amp up energy exposure to the Earth, okay, like that. That means activation for everyone at yeah. the same time. Okay, so that was kind of cool. And that circuit had the ability to go back and reprogram all the other circuits that were broken. And the reason I say broken, listen, Matt, and you, I don't know if you've started a family yet, you were talking about it, but when you end up with kids in school that are being exposed to certain things, concepts, sexual symbols, things like that, before the time that they're ready to process that information, it can really jack up those circuits in a kid. And they do this intentionally, by the way, okay? The confusion about gender, all this, it's done at a very specific time when those circuits are triggering in these kids, okay? But they don't tell you that. Yeah, of course. Okay? In, order, in order to cause long-term effects from that, yeah. okay? Well, luckily this ninth circuit has the ability to reprogram all of that. Isn't so, that beautiful? It really is. Having a circuit within us this ability to reset our system, like rebooting a computer, but completely cleaning it out and starting a, a That's right. new drive in it. It's like a fail safe uh, connection back to the creator of all, just exactly. in case you just get, it's, it's, it's amazing. So speaking of that, yeah. um, how's your energy? Is your energy changing relative to where our sun is in this whole holographic simulator? Is it the same? Where's it at? Where, you, where do you feel it? Is ascension happening in a slow motion boiling frog soup? I what, well what, for what me you, or for the general masses. Well, what's your opinion about the masses and then for you? Well, I've definitely noticed far more people that are contacting me and letting me know that individuals that they never thought would ever even pick up this information or consider it are considering it. And if just uh, five or ten years ago that people have said to me that those individuals never in a million years would have ever considered it. And so you see it happening all around you. It's not happening in terms of everybody just waking up at the same time. I think everyone's having their own levels of, of, of awareness changes, depending uh -huh. on all the different circumstances that have undergone in their life and what kind of an, a vibrational energy signature that they have. But uh -huh. either way, uh, I'm definitely seeing it. Um, it. It's occurring throughout society, but at the same time, it seems like the powers that be are doubling down right now during this time period. Uh -huh. They're doing like an increase of materialism and keeping us focused on um, beauty, beautification and non, this non, non idea of where, well, don't, don't pay attention to all that woo woo stuff about consciousness and energy and uh -huh. all that, you know, all that stuff. Uh -huh. that's, that's nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about you, but maybe we'll do a show. We'll talk about what, what we do on a, daily or approximate daily weekly basis as part of our matrix busting self routines to uh keep part of the the actual energy not part of the matrix energy it's it's not an easy thing it takes deciding to do it yeah um i mean i'd be happy just to mention a couple things um i remember sitting and reading about all the different things that affect your vibrational energy and, you know, at first you're like, ah, well, it's, it's me. I'm different, right? I'm not going to follow those rules. I can do whatever I want. But uh -huh. I, be I became very aware quickly that when I would, like, for instance, eat something that wasn't necessarily like organic or healthy, how that would affect your energy level. And it's well, why is that? Why is it that you were able to detect that and make a change? It's so obvious to me because we did that. That's how we ended up vegan, okay? It was just paying attention to what we're eating. Ah, it makes me feel like crap. I'm not eating that again. It's because I became open-minded to realizing that there are things that exist out there that we're not being told. And I, so I think it, it's a process of the mind realizing that 
here we are being bombarded on television and radio and on magazines to eat all this bad food and to just constantly mm -hmm. dine out and just consume large amounts of alcohol and all these things that can affect us in a negative way. And so to, to experience a completely different paradigm where when like what happens if you just drink things like spring water and you just eat organic and healthy food and you get out and you exercise and then you go out and you sit and you contemplate all the different experiences you've had that day and you try to reflect on how that affected your energy level all of a sudden you develop that awareness of every single aspect of yourself you know how did i treat um my colleagues and the people i was with today was i rude to them did i mm -hmm. just ignore them or did i maybe uh, you know hand out have my hand out to to pass on an olive branch to to speak to them and just help their lives a little bit all of those things when they compound them into this regiment lifestyle of how to live and how to be a good person all of a sudden it's like boom your energy level changes so rapidly mm -hmm. it can be shocking how <clears throat> fast that you can accelerate especially if at the same time that you're doing all of those things i just mentioned you're also studying ancient history in terms of ancient history that we're talking about, not just no. studying the mainstream doctrine in school, but study, studying the secrets of ancient history, studying about what these ancient cultures told us about, about the nature of reality. From the Gnostics to the Emerald Tablets, you know, what did they say about how we should be living our life and how we can change our energy level? And, I, and so when you have all those things together, it's, <clears throat> it's like basically you're that guy that stops doing all those things that they were doing before in terms of, you know, how come Matt's not meeting me at the mall anymore? We used to go to the mall to hang out all the time. Why, you know, why aren't we doing all these things? Oh, it's because he gave up drinking and he's on a religious binge. Exactly. So the first thing that most people do I know. is that they'll view that individual as something really strange is happening. They look at their life. Oh my gosh, what kind of path are they going down? But really, oh. that individual, like you know, is is the only one in that group who has decided to take that lonely road of bringing growth to their own consciousness and expansion of their of, of their of their awareness. Right. Well, that love that lonely growth that you're talking about, where you step and you decide you're going to put yourself on the mat and do a you know your yoga class by yourself or whatever it is your spiritual thing you're doing meditating. When people see you changing it, it makes them nervous, okay? Because they realize they're not doing anything. So, you, you know, you don't want to <laughs> overexpose them to the fact that you're changing. Uh, it's hard. Oh, yeah. I have family members that think I'm a total wacko. Totally crazy and strange and weird. I'm like, oof, what happened to that guy? But it's, and it's amazing at the same time because I understand why they would think that way. If I was on their side, I probably would think the same thing. But we have to understand that, like you know, we're here for a short time before we have to return again to do this over again. And we have to make certain choices. We have free will here. And we have to make certain choices about how we want to live our life and how we want to grow on a both, um, depending on a physical level in terms of realizing mistakes and things we do and how we do our actions, but also like on a spiritual conscious level with how we conduct our own mentality and how, our thought processes. And so that road we, that we decide to take, it's a lonely road because so much of society has been shepherded into this direction of conformity mm -hmm. and, um, and materialism and living in these false fear doctrines that, you know, it can seem like someone is totally crazy when they decide to change their life in a very quick and drastic way. And they'll usually blame something on it that's not related at all, just to right. try to find a reason. Right, right. Uh, you, you said something a se second ago that you have to live this life, you die, and then you come back. Do you think we have any choice in that matter if we progress to the point where maybe uh, we marked a few merits on the board and that we didn't have to come back if we didn't want to yeah i think there's um there's two things going on there one because this path and, and of course you can read all about the path and how to reach higher states and and look it back throughout history some of the individuals that have have, have achieved that mm -hmm. um, but i'm very i'm very attracted to that by the way 
that's that's my trip oh yeah of course but and so but the problem is um because the system has been created around us being stuck in this incarnation cycle everything is basically been designed like you know around this perfect system of you're going to end up following a path most likely that will lead you to have to come back here and do this over again right and, and so I, there's two things I that I, I i see going on there one if you do good things in your life and you continuously become a better person, that will have benefits for the next time around. There seems to be means where you get, you receive some kind of a better life and better circumstances if you do those good things in a previous life. On the other hand though, if you are able to go so far in one lifetime that you're able to reach that alt optimal state and become that, you know, that perfect being, then yeah, I do think that it's possible for you to ascend and break out of this incarnation cycle permanently. And mm -hmm. maybe it's that kind of situation, of course, we don't fully know, but it, it's that situation where perhaps you then receive the choice of coming back with right. that type of right. energetic signature if you want to. Imagine, imagine trying to come decide to do that after break, finally breaking out of this almost impossible system that's been created here to, to trap us. Well, to decide to come back would be like the ultimate sacrifice, wouldn't it? Well, I guess you'd have to decide if you had responsibilities here, kids here that you wanted to help, things like that that would influence your decision whether you wanted to come back. Um, I think there might be something kind of mechanical relative to the weighing of the feather, Matt. I wanted to bring this up with uh, sure. the Egyptian Book of the Dead and yeah. involves Thoth. And, and, uh, it, it seemed this weighing function to me had not so much about how much your heart weighed relative to a feather, but it probably had more to do with uh, to what extent were your seven chakras lit up that gave you the consciousness so that you could handle the next progression <laughs> in your school. Because, yeah, it's like uh, leveling up, basically. Yeah. Because uh, higher levels, exactly. Because when you get to the place where you realize we're in a holographic reality and that there are multiple dimensions and that really to traverse them, You've got to be so advanced that you leave your body behind and do it in your energy body, like talked about in the Emerald Tablets. So all that kind of stuff is attractive to me uh, to continue doing that. Not so much that I want to avoid coming back, because I do have kids in the simulator, and I, and I see them, and I'm like, how could you leave them behind, uh, trapped in bodies, so unaware, going through this matrix system? It reminds me of the discussion in the Lost Teachings of Atlantis when the first wave was here. They became chimeras and all these different animals and lost connection with the source. And uh, their peers were looking at him going, yeah, you did it to yourself, but you're still one of us. And I don't know how we can sit here and watch you be imprisoned like that with no connection back to ever yeah. being us again. Well, I guess that's how, I, I guess I see that whole reasoning a little bit differently um, because, and, and I don't have kids yet, so I can't reflect on that, but my my thought process would be that if you were to reach that level where you did dis you had the decision to come back you would i i personally would probably only decide to do it if it was a situation where it was more of like a collective change for humanity potential rather than just being like well i can come back and be there for my kids because you probably know like if you were to reach <laughs> absolutely the idea that you could actually help anybody ascend this is this is what i wanted to go back to you can be a guidepost for them to see and choose, but the more you're there and you think that you're going to change them to help them do it, the, the worse it's going to go. That's <laughs> exactly. So you might as well just remain non-physical energy and just influence them in positive ways like that. Because, you know, if you come back as like, you know, their neighbor, neighbor Fred that lives the next house over, that's strangely um, comfortable with them and sort of visits all the time. They're like, he kind of reminds me of my father. Like there's that whole mentality, mentality but um, I, I'm fascinated about the idea, Gerald, and maybe we can, we can approach this subject and talk about it, is the idea where if, if we're all part in these cycles that are all part of these ages of the Zodiac, right? And each, each age has a different type of energy associated with it and potentially individuals who are ruling it that can make decisions on how that goes, right? Mm -hmm. If that's true, then it would mean that they would have known that right now, this time period we're in is this age when 
consciousness, just like the Mayans and the Aztec. And if you look at Chichen Itza, this, the, the levels reached the top is, is universal consciousness. Right. If they knew all about that, right? They knew all about that that was going to happen, that human beings would no longer be kept in the veil of, of ignorance and deception. Then if you had a system where there are benevolent individuals that want a certain future here, right? Let's say that that's what the great challenge is, is what future will we, will we take? Was it mm -hmm. going to be a future of darkness and continuing this cycle of civilizations destroying themselves and then having to continue and rebuild? Or this, this type of future where we actually do pass on to the next golden age and we don't get destroyed and we reach a higher level? If that's true, just setting the stage for that, mm -hmm. then it would mean that if you had into energies, non-physical energies that are in, intelligent and, and more advanced that can, can choose... Because you'd be outside of time and space at that point. You, would, you wouldn't have linear time like we do. So if you had that choice, you would want to send everyone you had right now, wouldn't you? Everyone. You'd want to send every single individual that was a benevolent, positive energy spirit into incarnation cycles now. Because that, they would know that this oh. is the, the battle right now. Darkness that, versus light right now. I, I think that's actually true. And I felt like a long time ago, I told you, it seemed to me like there was a zodiacal ascension window as a function of entering the galactic center. Yeah. As you, as you count it down from 3,114 BCE from the Mayan calendar down to this place. Um, and it also agrees with Babaji's coaching of Swami Yukasar and the Yuga cycles relative to yep. the ascending Absolutely. and descending. 12,000 year cycle. It also agreed with the solar micronova cycle that we know changes human consciousness. By the way, let's, let's talk about that one just for a little minute, okay? I'm convinced after looking into the historical record on the earth that about every 12,000 years, the sun goes through a universal timing cycle where the certain elements within it become magnetically ionized because of the increase in quantiz quantized energy as it's approaching the galactic center, that these elements become available <clears throat> to be used as fuel. And uh, there was an article in Newsweek this last week that talked about a termination event at the end of solar cycles that they called uh, a tsunami event. And their idea was that something liquid in the core of the sun would migrate along the poles or the equator and then come in contact with the surface where these large uh, sun flares would happen. Yeah. Real, a real big burst of energy and then the next cycle would happen. Like that. Yeah. A crescendo event. Like a, and they didn't want to call it a micro nova event, but when that fuel becomes available on the sun to burn, <clears throat> the sun puts out a different energy. <clears throat> right? Yeah. And this micro nova, it's not a full explosion. It's just a kind of a hiccup, if you will, but it's strong enough hiccup and it's so precisely timed that we have records of it both in outer space on Mars and the moon with, uh, with particles of glass that have been caused by this explosion from the sun yeah. also on the earth. So we know this happens, okay? The question, the question is, uh, does anybody survive on the surface of the earth uh, when you have an event like this? I love and that truly topic. That topic is dear to my heart, Gerald. Well, you know who I'm talking about, and I'm going to give credit to the Diehold Institute. Uh, Doug Vogt did an absolutely tremendous job pulling the data together for that, because I was sneaking up on that date, and I was convinced that Swami Yukasar's date with Mabaji of exactly 12,000 years was pretty close, but they weren't accounting for the time in between transiting the center. Yeah. Yep. which basically turned out to be, uh, uh, well, if it was 24,000, you subtract that from a great year, 25,920, subtract 24,000, that was the difference in the time you spent in the middle. And they weren't really talking about that, but that could be the case, Matt, once we enter this galactic center, we could be in there for 1,500 years with uh, particles and electrons that are so stirred up around our galactic equator that, there's no life that can survive on the earth. <laughs> okay, so that's a Maybe. that's a great topic. Let me let me let me bring a little something to that so we can yeah, go, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Discussion. Um, that's a topic that I talk about very extensively because I believe exactly what you said 
is what seems to be causing this destruction to past civilizations. And I think that's the very purpose behind totally agree. Totally and I think agree. that's the very purpose behind places like Darren Kuyu in Turkey and some of these caves that have been found in India, in the Indus yeah. Valley civilizations. Sure. Some have called them ancient nuclear bunkers, which I don't think wow. that that's what they were. I think that they were literally these caves that were created in solid granite and, under, and underground in these certain types of areas to prevent um, the destruction of every single um, human being. I, I do think I agree. that. Yeah, um, I, I think, agree. I mean, why would you go underground for a flood? You wouldn't. But yeah. you would go underground if you had solar activity that was causing severe destruction on the surface of the planet. That solar sure. radiation would cause so many problems. And we could go into some of those problems, but oh, I know. basically destroy, depending on the severity of the situation and if you have an ice age or not, you would potentially have destruction, apocalyptic, apocalyptic destruction that goes so beyond any of these little minor events we've had over the last hundred years that it makes them on a magnitude of something like three or four times. Um, do, you think, do you think with the pole changing and what's happening right now that we might be approaching a solar micronova? Because it, yes. it has all the indications that that's what Everything it is. is lining up. You said 12,000 years is part of the cycle. Exactly right. 12,000 years ago is when the previous civilization was destroyed. Right. That can't and you go back to, you, you go back to no, and you go back to the, if you just look at when the ice ages happened, they happen relative to these solar micronovas. So, uh, you know, we kind of know when the Younger Dryas ended and uh, exactly. we're, due, we're due for another one. Okay? And it seems like what happens, it's, it happens every time. We're part of these cycles where what you said, this, these micronovas seem to be the transition that occurs between either a solar maximum to a minimum or a solar mm -hmm. minimum to a maximum. It seems yeah, like we get I, energetic yeah. change to our sun that seems right. to affect the entire solar system. And it's a universal clock, okay? Yeah. It's not, it's not inaccurate. This is the thing that the military industrial complex did not want people to know, is it's a repetitive, destructive cycle, and all the aliens knew it, that's why they built their bases underground, blah, blah, blah. Use this planet as a prison planet just to get resources from, and nothing permanent lasts here. It's too, it's too unstable Yeah. for all these beautiful buildings and civilizations they built here. Look what's happened to them. It, it's amazing. And I, so when, when I bring up places like, well, look at Eridu, you, know, you can still see evidence of Eridu in the deserts um, of the Middle East. And yet n our, our you know, archaeological mainstream world doesn't care at all about that site. Can, can you imagine if society learned, if, if they read <laughs> things like the Sumerian King List, if they I read know. the Eridu Genesis and they saw that, oh, look, Eridu is considered the first city ever created on Earth. Wouldn't it's, Earth be Station, Earth, it's Earth Station One. And yeah, I've been saying this for years, Matt. It looks like it's about 450,000 years old, the very first instance of a redo. And uh, nobody's interested in uh, the place at all. To show it's you a, that the, that's the proof behind it. For them not to be interested, but to actually have records of when they've gone out to visit the site and, and to, to investigate. So they know about it. To not oh, care shows you that they're deliberately trying to keep that suppressed so that people don't pay attention to it. Because yeah. if it was a monument and people were lining up to go visit it, they'd be like, wait a minute. This is the first city on <laughs> earth? Like, this is completely you know, altering the entire narrative that we've been taught in school about wow. apes slowly evolving and, and, being, and turning into hunter-gatherers and then somehow oh, yeah. coming I up know. with mathematics and learning about us astronomy and learning about agriculture oh yeah we just all came up with them ourselves even though ancient tablets say the complete opposite in mm -hmm. in multiple tablets too that's why i'm so obsessed with cuneiform records because they literally tell us these secrets about the past that are considered mm -hmm. forbidden today that's true that's true hey uh, we're going to be talking together again uh on the first of the year is that right wednesday wednesday okay so I'm thinking maybe we ought to save a couple of topics. We're going to be oh yeah yeah exactly. We're going to be yeah, with a we're going to probably other. be talking about that a lot because we're going to be talking about we'll be with, we'll people. be with a couple other people so our our exposure will be cut by a fourth right so <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> but but that's okay. Uh, do you feel good about what we covered today? Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, um, uh, anything you want to say to my people, your people, other than 
at least it's, Navidad it's, and all it's that an honor stuff. to talk to you again, Gerald. I can't emphasize enough for people that um, are supporters of my work, how important your work is and how a lot of my work blossomed out of meeting you and spending time working with you. Um, I don't know if I ever would have figured out the eagle and the serpent thing if it wasn't for you. Um, well, I'm, I'm honored that you, you, that you took the baton and ran with it, Matt. You know, because uh, listen, there's only so much, there's only so many people I can reach through my uh, filters and my uh, stigma, <laughs> my public stigma. And you, and you have a different energy and attraction to different people. So I think it's, I think it's complimentary. Thank you. And, and for us to be separated by such vast distances, but yet we, you know, it doesn't seem to matter at all. We work, we work really well together. Um, it really is an honor to be able to, um, I guess, continue to parallel and carry on the torch with you. This torch of truth along this lonely road of us going into this, you know, this darkness before yeah. the dawn and well, having the, the ability. Why, why, is, why is your uh, truth path lonely? Do you not have a group of people that you sit down? That I wouldn't say having... that my path is lonely. I just know that this is a lonely path. And I know that most individuals don't have mm -hmm. a YouTube channel with thousands of supporters. That's um, right. That's they're right. just on their own and they can just maybe talk to one or two other people. Maybe they're online with Facebook and groups, which I highly encourage. Other, there's a lot of great groups on Facebook where you can meet other individuals like you and talk about this stuff. But that's... in most cases, people are alone. Yeah, well, that's okay, that online stuff. You know, actually, I actually have to just tell you, I, I, hate, I hate the social virtual media thing. For instance, the other night we had four or five people around the dinner table and, you know, smoking and joking the whole thing. And next thing you know, we're, we're talking about topics that are important to these people and it's all about the truth, okay? And so you, end up, you can end up with these little truth groups, kind of like disciples of Jesus, if you will. Well, you have a small group of people that are exploring this reality in their local neighborhoods. They don't have to go on Facebook or other stuff. So find but some real, people real, have that, though. I know, but find it if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Create it if you have to, because it's worth it. It's worth oh, it. Oh, it is. I mean, you can't yeah. do this alone. You can't go down no. this road of changing the paradigm of reality yeah. alone. That's what I'm saying. Imagine you're like one person in a little tiny farming town in some foreign country, I don't know. And the whole town is of a certain mindset, yeah. blah, 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 they're all of a certain religion, they all do traditional events from the calendar together. And all of a sudden you wake up and now you're living among them and they think you're a freak, okay? Well, you got, you, got to take, you got to make some choices. You either got to get out of there so that you're not treated like a freak or you got to change them into freaks. Well, that's the thing is I think that those individuals that are alone in those societies, they're waking up for a reason. If it wasn't for them, who else would be doing that? So I think people need to take ownership of those positions they've been put in. And instead of looking right. at like just a lonely road of you ending up your life in a, in a bad direction, look at that as an opportunity where you could take right. that little community that you're around and try to be creative in how you could change some of their mindsets. That's, that's what I'm saying is don't wait for somebody to form a Facebook group for you if you're not getting the support. Because listen, all you got to do is start talking around to people. Hey, you ever heard of the Anunnaki before? <laughs> and, and these days, guess what? A whole bunch of people go, oh yeah, can we talk about that? It's not like it used to be, Matt. It's, no, people it's, are getting exposed to all kinds of stuff now. It's exciting, isn't so, it? It is in a way. So, well, let's save some of our enthusiasm for our next show. I've really enjoyed catching up with you. It's been about a year. I don't know. The yeah. last time we, re we really worked hard together was in the Anunnaki series. And you and I, we busted out a seven-episode series, remember? Way yeah, back and, then I, and then, of course, I... I ended up going on a little bit of a path where I had to, you know, pursue some things of my own. But in the end, um, you and I did a lot of great work together and I like to continue working with you um, very much. I really enjoy our, our discussions and our, you know, uh, putting our brains together to come up with this mastermind um, expansion of consciousness. And I, I don't know anyone that brings it to the level of talking about cultural software like you do. And I really love that computer side. That's like my favorite yeah, yeah. side. Of I have to give it up on Odyssey Key relative to uh, the work you and I did together in writing that. Okay. I haven't given up on that. Good. So Good. That was a great, some, that was a great little piece of work. I enjoyed that. 
Yeah, well, maybe uh, with, with time and the right circumstances, that thing will make it to the big screen. Yeah, just wait and, for the right time. This, right time. Tell the story. So uh, exactly. So we go. We go way back. Um, we're gonna get together again. Love you, Matt. Say uh, you, bye to all the folks, and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Okay. Thanks, Gerald. It was really good talking to you. Okay. Bye now. Structure is function is energy. Get your chakras aligned today with gravitybodyacademy.com.